Thank you for watching Scary Animal Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two. Then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications whenever we release new episodes. Welcome back to Scary Animal Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the hot African savanna located along the Luangwa River Valley near the village of Mafui in eastern Zambia. The climate is a tropical climate with a long summer rainy season leading to tall grasses and lots of animals dashing across the high plateau. The cool dry winters stress the plants and animals enough that migrations of nearly every kind of animal are a yearly event and part of the cycle of nutrients and energy. In the early summer of 1991, two boys were playing far too late after sunset. They were having fun playing and had lost track of time and were walking through the darkness returning home. As they walked, they were being followed by a very interested and dangerous party from the tall grass. As the boys neared a point that the cover and the road they were traveling on converged, a giant lion sprang from the grass and knocked one of the boys to his back. The lion bit the boy in the neck and subdued him in mere seconds. Upon seeing his friend taken down and killed, the other boy ran to get help. After running through the dark, the boy found some game rangers, and the authorities were called. The game rangers showed up and closed in on the attack scene, firearms at the ready. As they searched the attack scene, all that remained of the young man were a few tattered bits of his clothing, only parts of his chewed-up skull, and a few bone fragments. Almost 30 days later, a woman was walking around the edge of her village after gathering some necessities. As she arrived at her home, she put her provisions away and began her typical tasks as she readied for evening time. The giant lion stealthily crept up to her front door and knocked it down. It entered her hut and bit and clawed the woman severely. It wasn't long before the woman was too injured to continue the fight for her life, and she died. Upon discovering the attack scene, the authorities searched the scrub bush near the woman's hut and eventually found her remains. The lion had consumed all of her body, with the exception of her head and her arms. Her remains were buried, and the terror continued. The next night, a young man had made an agreement with one of his friends to sneak out and meet up. They were just planning on messing around and having fun together. On his way to the meeting point, the young man was ambushed by the giant lion right in front of the game ranger's office. The lion knocked the boy to the ground and began biting and clawing him around the head and neck, just as he'd done to his prior victims. A game ranger was nearby and overheard the attack. He stood up and fired his rifle into the air. The lion was startled and ceased the attack on the young man. The lion ran for the grass, leaving the young man with, with severe neck lacerations. The young man was taken to the hospital for immediate care, but the injuries he sustained during the attack would be too devastating, and he lost his life a short time later. Over the next few weeks, three more fatal lion attacks occurred, one of which involved a village woman on her porch. In the middle of broad daylight and just outside her door, a hunter lurked in the tall grass. As the local group of game rangers approached her hut, the giant lion appeared and savaged the woman right before their eyes. They fired a warning shot and the beast disappeared into the grass, unscathed. The game rangers arrived, but only a few moments too late to help the woman, as the lion had inflicted lethal wounds to her body. The villagers and authorities were at a loss for finding the predatory cat and decided to take the local lion pride down a few individuals. They set out on short hunting trips and seemingly randomly chose a lioness to blame and shot her, but that did not stop the attacks. Near the village of Nagozo, a woman named Jesseline was on edge ever since hearing of the attacks. She had just bagged her laundry to take to the river the next day for cleaning and laid down in her bed. While she slept, the giant lion knocked down her door and snatched her from her bed. Jessaline screamed in terror and pain as she was dragged off into the bush. The lion consumed her body, but would be back. By the middle of the next day, villagers watched a giant lion stride confidently up to Jessaline's house and walked right in through the door. It was inside for a few moments before it emerged carrying her bag of dirty laundry. For some reason, the lion backed the bag of laundry off into the bush. Perhaps it wanted a trophy to remind itself of its successful hunt. As the area residents peered out of their hut windows and banged on pots and pans to scare the lion away, it calmly carried the bag to the center of the village and set it down. It then roared loudly as it stared around at the huts now sheltering terrified residents. 
Then it picked Jessaline's laundry bag back up and strode confidently back into the bush. The giant lion was seen all around the village playing with the laundry bag like a house cat with a toy. It would carry the bag and bat it around and bite it. The villagers were terrified at the sight of the lion and assigned it a magical power. They believed the lion was a demon, and as it played with the bag, it was doing magic and casting evil spells. They said that the lion was actually a sorcerer, performing magic that would change his form into a lion so that he could terrorize the villagers. The predatory actions were such a shock to the area that professional hunters visiting for hunting trips decided to see if they could dispatch the murderous giant. One such hunter was a Japanese bounty hunter who specialized in finding specific individuals for removal. The bounty hunter set traps all over the area and pursued the lion for weeks, but came up with nothing. A second professional hunter named Adrian Carr was brought in and tried some of the same tactics and some new ones. Adrian hung a carcass about 10 feet off the ground from a tree, then set up a blind a short distance away. One dark night, while hiding in the blind, Adrian heard the lion's footfalls as he approached the bait carcass. He could hear the giant cat chewing on the meat and decided to let it eat for a few moments before shooting it. After about 20 minutes, he flipped on the spotlight and could see the giant lion standing on its hind legs, chewing on the suspended carcass. He aimed his rifle in its direction, but as soon as the light hit him, the lion flattened itself onto the ground and disappeared in the darkness before Wayne could fire a shot. Adrian unfortunately had the same result as the prior bounty hunter. The lion continually outsmarted even the most experienced bounty hunters. Wayne Hosek was an American professional hunter who was visiting the area on a private hunting trip as well. His party had come across the lion's favorite toy, Jasleen's laundry bag. The hunters decided to set up a large blind to watch the bag and stash of hippo meat they set out as bait for the lion. The men observed the bait for three weeks and, at many points, thought they had the man-eater, only to have it be a different species passing through in the night. They did manage to get the lion to come into the bait as its tracks were found circling the bait at daylight, but the stealthy creature slipped in and out without alerting the hunters. The hunters moved the site of the hunting blind a few times, but while moving it, the lion would slip in and take their bait from right under their noses. At one point, the lion even stole the laundry bag back without them seeing him take it. As the hunters were waiting for an opportunity in the blind, the lion would frequently creep around the blind, always managing to stay in cover so the men couldn't shoot him. He would roar and chuff close to the hunters, but remain concealed. At one point, Wayne took his camera outside to photograph one of the lion's massive tracks in the sand, and the camera wouldn't work. The hunters began wondering if the, what the villagers were saying about the lion having magical powers was true. The hunters knew the giant was watching them, seemingly constantly, and that he would take advantage of whenever they moved their blinds. They devised a strategy that they hoped would fool the brash predator. They would build a blind and put out the hippo meat as bait. Then they would leave the blind and take an observational position somewhere else. The hunters set up their decoy position overlooking the bait and their faux blind when they could see movement through the bush ahead. Wayne could see this lion coming in, and it was not slow walking in with caution or fear, but nearly trotting in with his hackles raised in aggression. As soon as the lion emerged from the cover that previously cloaked it, Wayne could see its immense proportions. It was clearly a male, but was maneless and very light-colored to a near cream color. Just as Wayne leveled the sight of his rifle on the lion's ribcage, it turned its head directly to the hunters and growled in disdain and acknowledgement. It knew they were there, but Wayne fired a clean kill shot and the giant man-eater collapsed. The hunters approached the sprawled lion from the rear and waited for 25 minutes before convincing themselves it was actually dead enough to touch. Charles, who was Wayne's hunting partner, pulled his camera out for a picture and his camera also mysteriously malfunctioned and would not work. The magical mystique of this lion didn't stop with his heartbeat. After the hunters brought the lion carcass to the villagers to prove to them they no longer needed to fear it, they celebrated. The villagers hit the carcass with sticks and spit on it in contempt. The local shaman performed magical ceremonies to permanently banish the spirit and power of the lion from their area. While compiling the research on this episode, I discovered that most man-eating lions are female, but when they are male, they tend to be maneless males, like the man-eater of Mafui. Some contend that the maneless lions, sometimes referred to as buffalo lions, due to their size, aiding their buffalo hunting, are an ancient line of lions with archaic genetic traits. 
Many man-eaters are down and out, meaning that they predate on humans because they are old or diseased. They may have had a severe injury or a broken jaw from a zebra or giraffe kick and could only hunt humans successfully. This may cause them to lose their manes due to malnutrition, but the man-eater of Mafui was robust and healthy. Some theorize that the man-eating lions lost their manes due to an overabundance of testosterone in their system, which does shrink hair follicles. That theory offers an explanation for the aggression as well. Please post your theories, comments, or observations in the comments section below so we can chat about it. Also, if you enjoyed this episode, please consider giving it a like and subscribing. Clicking on the bell option keeps you notified of our new episodes, and sharing our videos on your social media platforms is fun. Special thanks to our latest Patreon with the username The Nanonites. Thank you for watching Scary Animal Attacks, and as a valued member of our human community, please be safe out there because you do not want to end up on an episode of Scary Animal Attacks.